I want to turn now to our panel members um, and I'm going to ask them all to introduce themselves um, and to start by telling us just a little bit about the context in which they have encountered this issue. What's the context? What's the response that they have, they've had to deal with in the work that they are all doing? And they will tell you each what that work is. So perhaps if I could start with you, Deb. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so first of all, I want to acknowledge Marsha because actually we wouldn't be in this room talking about adolescent violence in the home if it wasn't for her amazing work. Can you just give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> you know, we all, we all get to meet you know, with other people around the world and really um, that work is uh, the work that she did uh, with her colleagues as Stella, so thank you. In terms of our work at the centre, uh, it, at the touch points are a number and I'll mention a few. Um, so, the agencies that we work with every day work with thousands of families. Some of these families um, have touched the child protection system, but they've certainly touched other systems, uh, certainly Commonwealth systems. Uh, many of them increasingly are on cashless card. Uh, they may or may not be struggling with the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We know that for some of those women, um, that if they have had contact with the child protection system as a, as a young woman, as a child, uh, it's seven, there's a 70% likelihood that their children will also have contact with the child protection system. And that their lives, um, uh, have in, within their lives, they've both experienced violence in their family of origin, uh, but also in the community around them. Uh, and for some of those young women, particularly if they were in care themselves, they may likely have experienced sexual exploitation. And so it's a pretty difficult and complex set of circumstances that many of the families that we work with face. Um, and in many ways, that's where, you know, DV, Vic and the centre completely overlap. Um, notwithstanding that, for some children who are in care themselves, they are also experiencing um, significant violence um, within the context of the care system. And... Um, it isn't until you start to really think about the extent of that that you realise that it's in sort of epidemic proportions and, and much of it not really talked about and sort of underreported in that it's just sort of expected. For some of those women that I'm talking about who are raising their own children, they are incredibly oh. isolated. This sort of... Uh, we did a short, sharp survey of 30 families online, so it was anonymous um, a couple of years ago, and there's this assumption that women have got these networks, you know, they've got peers, they've got you know, aunts and uncles and people who can do childcare for them. They said to us they were really isolated. Um, and in fact, confidence was a very big issue. If you meet some of these women, they really, some of them have had the stuffing kicked out of them um, and they're very resilient nonetheless. So that's the sort of the, 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 the environment that we're in. And, and I suppose from our point of view, intervening as early as possible with, with um, particularly those women is really, really critical. Um, and addressing some of the stigma that they face in their everyday lives. That's enough for me. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. Um, am I working? Can't you tell are. yet. Great. Um, so my name's Leanne Anthony. I work for Family Safety Victoria. Um, I've probably been in the adolescent family violence space for about two years from a policy and program lens. However, I would have to say that my 25 years in children and families has been about these young people. Thinking about they have been known to our system, we've known them in the first five years of life, we have to think about the complexity. And I think for me, the last, this day is almost for me like brought a whole range of dots together. Research that we've been hearing about over the last 12 months. Practitioners talking about their practice wisdom and the words about evidence builders that was used this morning. But also for me, this panel reflects DV Vic, Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare, DHHS and FSB, sitting here having a conversation about what's our systemic early intervention trauma-informed therapeutic response for these young people and their families and their siblings. And I think the other part for me is my passion is also about therapeutic interventions. So in the last 12 months, 
we have put out about $20 million or just over the therapeutic, family violence therapeutic interventions. We want a specific focus on children and young people. I think the part of that is how do we start testing and building the evidence to understand what works? Because we need to start thinking about children and young people on their own rights. So I'm pretty passionate about this space, as you can tell. Um, but I also want to just recognise for all of us, we've had significant reform and system enablers like child information sharing, family violence information sharing and MARAM. And that would not have happened without the foundational work of the Royal Commission. And we are an Australian and world leader in that context. We've got some way to go. But I think this conversation is a beginning systemic conversation about our response. Thanks, Leanne. Um, and I'm Alison MacDonald from Domestic Violence Victoria. Um, and, you know, clearly adolescent use of family violence in the home is an issue that challenges how our system responds to family violence in, in the, the post-Royal Commission environment in Victoria. I think in terms of our engagement in the issue, um, hopefully you will have heard... Um, from our team earlier in one of the breakout sessions about some of the work um, that we've been doing uh, with the Centre for Evidence um, for, at Drummond Street in the Geelong region. Um, but um, you know, as the peak for the family violence sector, I think um, you know we're really cognisant that responding to adolescents and young people who use violence against family members doesn't really neatly fit into any of our existing service systems. And it really does present us with some quite acute challenges around multidisciplinary practice between the specialist family violence sector, between child youth and family services, but also with um, services that work with, um, with people that use violence as well. Um, and in many ways, what we see, and I'm sure you would have heard a lot about the cracks and the gaps in the system today, that we, we see young people falling into those gaps. So I think that's, present, that's why we can't look at this issue um, without thinking about it in multidisciplinary terms. Um, I think, um, you know, it, it's very difficult in a service system that tends to be very geared towards working with individuals and individual problems. Um, and a lot of work needs to happen in our service systems to reorient us, to enable us to do, um, to do that uh, work that involves working with all the members in a family. Um, I think children and young people are obviously clients in their own right, so family violence services. Um, but this, is, this has been a, a, a difficult area for family violence services historically um, in the work that they do with children whose mothers are also clients because it's never been properly resourced. And despite that, I think there's been quite some quite um, sophisticated programs um, around adolescent use of violence in the homes that have, that's developed, but it's not been systemic, it's, it's been ad hoc. Um, so it is an undeveloped area for specialist family violence services. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes we need to acknowledge that the binaries that we tend to use about victim survivors and perpetrators um, doesn't apply um, when we talk about adolescent use of violence. Um, and we really need to um, start thinking differently um, about that in this issue. Um, and I think we, our service systems haven't necessarily been set up well yet to navigate the space in between. Hi. I'm Anita Morris. I'm the Family Violence Principal Practitioner at DHHS. Uh, as a practitioner, I think that this is one of the issues that has always sat there. Um, and I feel that with everything that's happened in Victoria in terms of the reforms, it's our next frontier to really tackle. But um, Liana made a good point uh, about the need for community awareness. And so until we understand something as a problem, we're not very good at looking at what are the solutions. Um, and having sat uh, with people from different sectors and across government, um, even defining the problem has been difficult. I think today has been a really good example of the different language that's used depending on which sector you come from. Um, there's some beautiful language that's used around working with young people using behaviours um, that we might find challenging or difficult in the disability sector. Um, it's reframed slightly differently in the education sector. We talk about adolescent use of family violence in the home, in the family violence sector. So even starting to share each other's language and 
uh, coming upon a common language that we actually feel is really um, positive and supportive for these young people as they um, develop and grow and start to reflect on and change their own behaviours, but also the ways families want us to work with them, um, with this young person, so that the family is able to be supported um, through the young person's journey as well. I think I'm really encouraged that we have forums like this. Um, I was overseeing some training to child protection in family violence uh, in the last couple of years and it was really um, sort of starting at the beginning and saying how are we going to define this problem for child protection um, to or this issue that um, comes up very frequently in their work, particularly when they're looking at um, each child within the family and how to respond in terms of their safety needs and wellbeing. Um, but you need to have a good understanding of the problem. And then, as we always suggest to practitioners, what's your referral pathway as well? That was a challenge because the referral pathways sit in so many different sectors and where we don't have that broad, consistent understanding of the problem, um, you don't want to set people up to fail. You don't want to send them to a service system that looks like the right one to be told, mm, your problem doesn't quite fit here. So I think as we create more opportunities, um, as funding becomes more tailored to what we think we need, um, we'll be much better placed to respond to this issue. Well, I think we've heard some wonderful uh, preliminary comments. The ones that I would pull out relate to the need for more information um, on which to base programs um, and I think, I think it's a comment that I heard Elena Campbell make, not on this occasion, but she said data shapes policy. So if you don't have data, then very often your policy isn't shaped. You don't have a policy. Um, so all of that issue, all of those issues I think you've explored today about evidence are really important. Um, we've also heard, I think, from Anita and I think a couple of the other speakers about the need to increase community awareness and we've also heard from all speakers about the gaps and the, the way systems don't marry up together and I do remember at one of our community consultations a woman sitting there in a state of complete despair and she said well I was told I better leave, I was very frightened to leave because I knew it was going to be very dangerous. I left and now I've got one son who's absolutely furious with me because I've left um, and who's violent because he's modelled himself on his father's behaviour and I shouldn't have left his father and another son, the other son, who's absolutely furious with me because I didn't leave earlier. And she said, what do I do and where do I go and what are the systems that are there to support all of us? Um, and I think you've all highlighted that as an issue. So perhaps if I could now um, ask each of them to talk about the elements that would be in their ideal system. If you were starting with a clean sheet, what would you, what would you, I think I'll ask you each to pick three things that you would include in that system. If you could start again, redesign the system, what would you do? Deb, start with you. Um, well, I mean, I, I have to say, I think some of the answers are in this room. I mean, I, I, I am in listening to my research colleagues this morning. Um, you know, we wait ten years. Who, who, who said we wait ten years? One of you said we leave it till kids are thirteen and fourteen, but really we should be starting at five. So we certainly don't work with families early enough. And often the families ask for help in the way they are. They ask for help, and it's not enough. So intervening early using the best available evidence. And I think the, the second thing is that I mean, one of the things that both the Mental Health Law Commission and the Family Rights Law Commission have told us very early is listen to what families and young people say that's going to work for them. Um, we still haven't quite got there, but I think we are moving in strongly in that direction. So I think those two things are really important. And I think if you want to have a sustainable response to young people and who are using violence from time to time and their, and their parents or carers, um, we actually have to make sure that the research to practice tra translation and sector level is happening because um, I think that today I've spoken to lots of people who've got lots of brilliant ideas but and want to scale them 
um, we need to make sure that we, we have a way to do that. And I think on that last this morning talked about our research to catch this hub and that there's been a big cultural shift in our sector about understanding how to use the evidence, evidence-informed practice, evidence-based models. And we've got an army of people out there who are becoming experts in their own right and delivering the right sorts of services. So for me, it's, as I said, it's about getting in early. We're 10 years too late working with um, women and, and quite young children, I'd have to say. Most of the kids that come into care are under five. That must tell you something. Uh, we don't let them early enough. Um, and then they'll be empowered about our work with our elders and our people, which is, we know are tricky anyway. Uh, uh, it's listening to what people say they need and offering them choices about the collection of interventions that might work for them and then making sure that we have a sector-led approach that's sustainable so that we don't stop and start, we don't pilot things and then stop things, but it's truly sustainable. They'd be the, my, my three things, but there's lots of others. Can I just ask you about the comment about translating evidence into practice? Um, because that was one of the things that we noticed, that there were some terrific programs out there. And this is an example of a situation where we can inform people, but it's not long term. It's one off and we'll all go away feeling very excited about what's happened. So um, perhaps we might want to think about how we can build that into the system. Perhaps the other speakers could think about that a bit, or unless you want to say something, Deb. Look, I think that we're very lucky in the Societies and Families space. We've been funded by DHS to set up a portal that's for workers. Right. But also we have a team of people who are out in the oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. Uh, that are out, a team of people that are out in the field. <laughs> Um, who are helping people analyse data, look at evidence-informed um, practices, looking at how to implement evidence-based models. So we've actually got infrastructure that um, is making that happen. I mean, to be honest, you actually do need to invest in, in those activities in order to bring people along. Uh, and now there's a huge reliance on that. I mean, there's a few of them in the room. Is Mandy here? Uh, there's a few of them. I mean, Michelle's up the back. So we've actually been in the, the peak who supporting the sector and the workforce has been invested in to do that. And you sort of actually need that, really, to be honest. And can we, will that be sustained? Well, uh, I don't know whether our funder is... Oh, uh, uh, Leanne's here. She can go back and talk to them. But, but some of it is... All, <laughs> you are funding it. But, but I think that um, I'm pretty confident, given the results, that we've seen a significant uptake uh, and confidence in the workforce, that I'm, I'm pretty... The, the results are there. Uh, but you're right, you actually have to have something embedded that's fully focused on that. You can't just have a one-day forum. I'd like to have, see a statutory Ooh. body. Well, like, we recommended yeah. something yeah. like that, and, yeah. and we haven't yet got that, but some sort of statutory body, which would then, it could do the contracting out and things, but it would oversee the whole system. So, yes. Um, I don't know what to say, can I? Oh, no. <laughs> your your oh, three oh, 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 Sorry. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, I think um, on top of your three, because I think it's just we're going to add yes, the dot right. points because yeah. I want those three things as well. Um, I think there's something for me as a good old public servant that I want to have a system where there's a lot more flexible funding for agencies to actually have a um, flexibility in how they work, when they work, what they apply about what works. So I think there are conversations to be had about that over time. I think the introduction of things like flexible support packages gives us a sense about how we can start thinking about flexibly responding because I guess um, we have to move away from specific programs to actual mixed modalities of intervention that can look at intensity, that can look at sequencing, that can look at readiness for young people and families. And I'd really love to start thinking about how we shift the system to be much more flexible. Um, I think the other bit for me, and, um, and I'm not sure what this is, but we really need to give a lot more time and thinking for and space for Aboriginal community to lead and design their own responses. We know the over-representation of Aboriginal children and young people in care, in child protection, in youth justice and in youth suicide. We really have to give 
Um, and I think Victoria, again, is a leader in terms of ACAC and actually giving control back to community for children in care, but I think we can do a lot more in that space. Um, that's only two. Um, I think the other thing is specifically about, and I think it really resonated with me um, when Deb was presenting about the education outcomes. So what are the outcomes we want for these young people? Being really clear of collective outcome measurement um, because data defines policy, but we need to be clear about what we want to achieve. Thanks. Um, I don't know if this will come out as three coherent points. Um, and I'm going to repeat Deb's point about early intervention. I think um, absolutely critical that we work with people earlier, but also because we know that a really vast majority of adolescent perpetrated um, family violence in the home is um, set against a backdrop of often intimate partner violence in that um, with um, among the parents um, within that family. Um, and we know that the adolescent use um, of violence is... Um, uh, there's often trauma in the background for those kids. That early intervention in terms of supporting those families with, um, with the family violence dynamics is actually an intervention in um, future adolescent use of violence. Um, I'll jump right to the other end of the spectrum as well and say that... Um, we also need long-term recovery programs and that's, you know, there's a huge... Everybody knows that there's a dearth of, of um, program responses for, for adolescents and young people in our system and I think that, um, uh, you know, as long as our, as long as our system um, doesn't invest in that, in those long-term recovery programs, um, uh, we're not going to see... Um, we're not going to see that generational change um, because, of course, you know, it's not it's not a straight line. The long-term recovery is, is actually a, a preventative um, strategy for future um, for future family violence. Um, so there are a couple of things. I mean, the other thing I just would probably reiterate is just um, the focus on multidisciplinary solutions, um, which is what I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Okay, um, I think we need to pay more attention to evidence as Marcia has suggested and um, in my thesis I um, quoted this um, GP called Gaylord um, who was writing in 1975 who actually said, um, I'm really worried about these mums that I'm seeing that are disclosing uh, domestic violence as it was called then and I'm really worried about these little boys. And um, of course, the language was different at the time. So talking about the need for instruction or education for these little boys so that they don't grow up to be violent. And I don't think we pay enough attention to the evidence that's there um, at a point in time. We certainly build more, um, but if we started to think about what does this evidence tell us about what we need to do, I think we'd be better placed. And a really significant piece of evidence that has informed my thinking has been um, certainly a lot of Cathy Humphrey's work in the mother-child space, um, that the perpetrator undermines the mother-child relationship. And it's really dawned on me of late that we don't pay enough attention to what does that look like? What that looks like is adolescent family violence in the home. So when we understand what undermining looks like, not only in the immediate um, and there was an amazing um, slide that flashed up this morning. You know, the, the little boy was a babe in mum's arms and dad was perpetrating violence. And that same little boy has gone on to perpetrate violence against mum. So we know what happens if we don't intervene early. Um, what do we do with that? We do something different earlier. Um, so I think it's just worth paying attention. I think the other thing that was flagged today was that idea of the need for... Um, upskilling of the workforce, training and support. So we can say what we need, but then how do you get people there to be able to deliver that? Um, I think the department's um, going to be releasing in the near future a um, framework for trauma-informed practice, but that goes to system level. So reforming our system um, so that we all work to the same principles, even if our programs are tailored to particular client needs. 
we need to really make the most of the information sharing reforms so that we are talking to each other about these young people and about their families. We need to better use the development of the MARAM framework to start to say, um, what else do we need to know about people when we're under trying to understand risk? And in the development of perpetrator tools, which will be coming later this year, I think we actually need to know whether those, that perpetrator's behaviour is starting to be displayed in the children within the home because that could be a really diff a different point where we start to think about the needs of the whole family. We're pretty good, as you said, Alison, we're pretty good at compartmentalising our responses, um, but why don't we use these tools to start to think about what else we need to know? Uh, and as part of um, thinking about the training needs... Um, I was given some funding through the Victorian Training Guarantee Fund by FSV to look at how we strengthen family violence practice for different workforces. We're um, finalising a suite of um, training videos and one of them we've actually um, worked with an Aboriginal actor to show you one minute and it talks to that mother-child relationship and what might be going on. So I'm going to wave. He's just walked away. I'm waving to the eye. Hello. Video. <laughs> so I might explain after we watched it. I always put the blame on my mum. And I think some part of me still does because we were kids, you know, Josh and I were kids and he was just so aggressive and had this streak that would just come out and she, she wouldn't do anything. I wanted her to fight for us and she didn't. And I think I just, growing up, I really, yeah, I really despised that. And for a really long time, I was so mad at my mum. And I know that it wasn't her fault. And I found it really hard to be angry at him because it was such a strong energy and I felt so small. But it was so much easier to relate that back to mum instead of myself or him. I think I still blame her for things that happened when I was a kid. Guess it makes her feel. That's it. <laughs> no. So I just want to explain that earlier in the video, she talks about the fact that her mum was quite unwell mentally and was um, often in bed. And so that's why she talks about that idea that mum didn't protect us, mum didn't do anything, but mum was actually really struggling. Um, and this case study is of um, an Aboriginal family. So mum is Aboriginal, um, the children are Aboriginal, dad's not Aboriginal and dad is very racist towards um, mum and towards the extended family. So he doesn't want the children to have contact with their grandparents even though because of his violence um, he's spent periods of time in jail and um, the children have actually been in kinship care with the grandparents throughout their lifetime. So they, um, and, and mum, we've got some other videos, mum really encourages that the children have a strong connection to their culture, um, but they talk about dad's undermining of that. Thank you. Now, my, my mic is on again mysteriously, that's good. Um, and that picks up on the point that, uh, the point that I can't remember who made it about the work that, that Cathy and her team have done, and I think you made it too, um, about that complexity in, in Aboriginal communities and in communities where one member of the, of the family is Aboriginal and how we really need to look to those communities for help in devising solutions. Now, I'm, I'm, how, how much more time have we got? Okay, good. Um, so I wanted now to turn to the issue of... <coughs> I promise you it's not for us. Um, <laughs> I want to turn to, 
to the issue of the silos between the systems. Yes, I should move, stand back. The silos between systems, um, which all of you have mentioned. Um, and we've, we've come up with some possible ways of dealing with this, but I wondered if any of you had some further suggestions to think about ways that we can encourage people um, to work together. And I, I've got another anecdote. Sorry, I'm very anecdotal. Um, I remember when, when the uh, Royal Commission had a number of consultations in country areas, one of the things that was said to me by someone after one of these sessions had finished was, oh, that was really terrific. It was really great to meet people from another service in the same area. And I, I found that quite amazing that we'd had to organise a consultation for the people dealing with this issue, housing, to talk to the people dealing with the violence issue or whatever it might happen to be. So obviously those people are very busy, they're overstretched and the thought of, perhaps the thought of ringing someone they don't know in another service and talking to them about the issues is really important but I don't know how we go about opening people's minds to doing that. So any suggestion? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I suppose I'll... Um where will I begin? I actually think that um, some of the biggest challenges are with the big systems. So uh, it's very difficult for vulnerable people to navigate some of our big bureaucracies. Impossible. Almost. I mean, I just feel. And so I think that um, I think that I think sectors do try and work together, and they do quite admirably. But I, I think resources sometimes inhibit that too because you've got this thing you've got to deal that's right in front of you. But also I think the value of sectors is they can help bureaucracies to connect because sometimes we have more information about uh, how that can happen than others. But I do think that, you know, big systems like child protection, education, some of these big systems are really difficult and I, I do wonder whether we should be much more honest about the fact that some of those big systems are all, they're great, but they're also inhibitors. And I'm not quite sure. I think that we have to have some honest conversations about how we can support that change, because it's not easy. Especially, I mean, I, I'm in meetings lately where um, we senior child protection people, where they are beyond overwhelmed. We're talking frozen with demand. And so we have to be empathetic about that. But what can we do to help? So I think that so there's some new things that have emerged that are becoming really problematic, I think, in regards to that. But I do love, you know, there's lots of examples of tripartite work. We're running a Tripex project. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that Alison and Jackie Watt will join our open portal. Like, we all try, but I think at the end of the day, um, we haven't systematised it. But we, we'll get there <laughs> one day. Do you want me to go? Are you no, I'm, me? I'm, no, I'm happy to go. Um, I'm just reflecting on Jim's yeah. comments. Um, I think large bureaucracies are hard to join up. We know that historically. Um, I think it's finding the enablers to do that joining up. And I think, as Anita was saying earlier, I think those frameworks like MARAM is actually about our opportunity to, to build the bridges between those bureaucracies with shared language shared understanding around risk assessment and risk management, but also about practice. What, what you know, I think the therapeutic and trauma-informed framework, how do we start to have some of those system enablers that can help us? Because I, I don't, I think we've got a long way to go in this space, adolescent family violence, and it never ceases to amaze me, and um, my team's probably sick of me saying this, but three words, adolescent family violence, that is trying to encapsulate such complexity and we think about ranging right through from Victoria Police to disability. I, I think we've got some, we've got work to do, but I don't think it's not impossible. Um, yeah, yeah, obviously we've recognised the kind of the systemic barriers to bridging a lot of those silos. But I, I actually think in this topic of young people's use of violence, we've actually got real opportunities to test out um, some of these um, more collaborative approaches to practice. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, if you, if you look at a family where there is um, risk being presented from, um, you know, perhaps a young person, but also 
um, you know, commonly from the father in that family as well. Um, you know, there are, there are real opportunities to work in ways that, um, you know, you're bringing people in to work with the mother who is might, op, might be the victim survivor of violence from both a partner or an ex-partner plus a teenage child. You've got opportunities to work with the father in that context and the young person themselves. Plus, you know, look at, at working with the siblings too. And I think there's some there's some real opportunities there to kind of test out some quite innovative ways of working um, as we collectively try to address this problem. Um, uh, I know if Dean McWhorter had been on the panel, he would have talked a lot about, um, you know, the fact that um, the police trajectory is one of the only instruments that we've got at the moment. And it's... Um, you know, it's, it, but we recognise that it's really problematic to criminalise these young people. It's, um, and we can't, we can't continue to do that. And, you know, and there are particular groups of young people who are additionally at risk who tend to be over-criminalised anyway, like particularly Aboriginal young people, of course. Um, uh, so I think, um, you know, I'm reasonably optimistic as long as we, um, you know, can make proper investments that... Um, that, that um, we can find solutions in the multidisciplinary approach. From a system perspective, I think that we have real opportunity in the other reforms that happen around this space. So early intervention in mental health creates avenues to think about um, what will mental health do differently, what will universal services do in terms of reflecting the need to identify early mental health issues in families. Um, that can then pick up and address issues of a young person using violence. Um, similarly, the Disability Royal Commission, I think NDIS, we heard um, a good example today where NDIS packages can actually be used to support a young person in different ways um, that you wouldn't traditionally think about as addressing adolescent family violence. So it is about working a bit smarter in the systems that we already have and are reforming to keep this issue on the agenda in those spaces uh, and use those recs, whatever those recs are that, that are on the table and, and implemented um, to get the best bang for our buck for families. I think in terms of the practice and ways of working, um, I echo your thoughts around collaborative practice. I think we have models that are family-led and they're probably the best ones um, to model something on in this space because actually families want to feel like they are in control of what happens um, in terms of the young person, um, but also they don't want the whole family unit to be um, broken down as a result of being pushed into different types of responses. Um, or, um, you know, there was a great example um, around an Aboriginal service today you know, the, up in Mallee, identifying that actually we're often um, finding it, the young person using violence because mum and other children have accessed the refuge, dad's in the perpetrator program. So, you know, there you have it, the whole family's in that service. Um, I think it's really interesting when we reflect on is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I think it's a really wonderful thing um, if the family think that that's going to work for them. And they've already discovered that this is a safe space to talk about what's going on for them. So um, I really encourage models where we don't send people in all different directions. And I think care team meetings. So through um, some work I've been doing uh, with practitioners lately um, where they are talking about the benefits of the information sharing schemes, they're saying we get invited to more care team meetings. And they're in spaces, so specialist family violence are going to care team meetings in schools. Um, they're in spaces where they do have opportunities to put their lens or their specialist knowledge into the thinking around um, working with families. So I'm really encouraged by that. So, <coughs> Anita, you've given Anita, you've given an example of a very practical, fairly small thing to do that is in the context of care team meetings. Would it be helpful to have some of these? Um, practices, and I'm now talking about the sort of on the ground level, because most of well, the people all up on this platform are all people who are involved in policy, they're all at a more advanced level, 
Um, and I'm thinking about the workers on the ground who are having to respond to terrible situations very quickly often. Would it be helpful to have a series of sort of propositions about things that might be done if you're in that situation, if you're the young social worker or whatever, with a child protection matter? where there's possibly violence and a whole series of other issues, would it be helpful to have some mechanisms for transmitting better practices to those, those sorts of people? And is that something that's being done? I think it's being done because I think these mechanisms exist. Have we harnessed... Um, we're very reactive. I think humans are just very reactive. So if I think about what are the really good mechanisms we've got in place, when there's a crisis, we've got our emergency services lined up, ready to go. When it's a high-risk family violence case, we've got our ramp set up. We're not very good at mobilising around the lower level areas of risk that will that escalate. Exactly my point, we will become, yes. yeah. So it's using the mechanisms we've got, but just shifting them to earlier and earlier intervention. Interesting. Um, finally, I think I'll ask everybody on the panel to comment on what do you think we really need to know to do it better? What are the big gaps in existing knowledge? And what kind of training should we be doing to help people to respond better to adolescents, family violence in the home? I mean, why not gap that seems obvious to me is the example you gave, Anita, that is the example of the how do you intervene with little boys? Um, small children, what do you do in that area? Do we know anything about what works in that area? But there, may, but there are probably many other gaps in knowledge that we don't have. So can I ask you all perhaps to nominate one gap you would like to see filled, if you can, an area where there's a real gap and where we need data and we need evidence and we need experimentation. Perhaps we could start with you, Anita, this time, because we've always gone the other way. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to be a bit controversial. Starting with the young person, we haven't actually done a really good job of that at this forum. I don't think we've heard enough from young people themselves about this issue. Um, someone in the audience earlier mentioned that they were doing research with young people using violence. I think we need to go to them and find out more, and they, they are a hard group to to access, to engage, to get your ethics approval, all sorts of things. But unless we um, go to where young people are, which is often online, and um, find out more about how they experience the world and why some of the things that they experience then mean that they behave in a certain way, we're not going to solve this problem. Um, I've heard really good stuff too about going to where the young person is to intervene um, and... Uh, someone talked about, you know, traditional good old youth work, getting in the car, having the young person beside you. All of that's really good, but you can't isolate the family in that space. You've got to really make sure that it's an inclusive way of engaging that keeps the family on site as well and engaged in the change. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can narrow it down to just one area. <laughs> um, because, I mean, it's obviously a real emergent area and there are considerable you know, data and evidence and research gaps. Um, and, you know, I think we, we we probably need to do a whole heap of investigation into this, the safest and the, mo the most evidence-informed um, ways of responding to adolescent use of family violence. Um, one thing I wanted to point to specifically was um, we really need to understand the intersection of... Um, disability and young people and family violence and that um, obviously that plays out a lot in that um, we understand a really high proportion of young people who come to the attention of the service system also may have cognitive disabilities as well and I think we don't know nearly enough about a those experiences but of of using violence in that context, but also about what we can, what our service systems can do. I think there's a huge need to um, look at the collaboration with the disability sector, building capability within in the NDIS in particular, um, to around family violence, but family violence with young people in particular. Um, and I think we also need to invest in longitudinal studies because we're not going to understand what we need to understand about long-term generational change unless we do that. Thank you, Liam. Um, I was probably going to reflect Anita's comments about 
I think we have some way to go to capture the voice of young people and their experiences of both the system but what they need from us in this space. Um, I also think there is emerging evidence in regard to the intersect between adolescents who use violence in the home, sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, which I think we need to think about that in on the agenda over time and what that what that means for us as a service system. Um, and probably the other space for me would be um, actually, um, and I guess it goes to Deb's questions about open, like how do we actually have a sense about fidelity, about what works and how do we continue to build that into our system with the complexity of these young people's lives? Um, they're probably my three. Thank you. Yeah. Um, where to begin? Oh, goodness. Um, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I said earlier, I think the new frontier is really client-led, client-led work. There's no doubt about it. And the National Disability Insurance Scheme is the sort of um, the, uh, the bastion of that at the moment. It's not perfect, but certainly when you talk to people where it's working, it's working brilliantly. I've got a friend, she's a bit older than me, lives in a nursing home. She's 60. She's about to move out into her own place with support. And that would not have been unheard of um, even three, four years ago. So I think that um, whether it's, uh, you know, the hard to reach um, young person or parents, I think I think we have to go there. And I think that, you know, we have a few young people who have used services and been in care working for us and uh, they don't really like the way we talk about them. And they want us to talk much more about their resilience and what they do well. So I think that there's something in that that I feel quite emotional about. Um, I think that actually we do know much more about what works than we think we do. Um, the talent that's in this room is remarkable. You know, I've talked to lots of people about the things that they're doing that are really effective. And I think we actually have to... Um, be kinder to ourselves about what we actually do know because we know a lot and then we can work out where the gaps are. Um, so for me, I think um, building some confidence around that I think is really important um, and, um, and starting, from the, starting from the positive because actually we are, apart from all the issues like corona and bushfires and everybody's been corona today, I'm getting lots of messages about what we're all now meant to do. Um, I think that Victoria should be proud of where it's at, notwithstanding we're under some pressures. And so I'm a bit of a, you know, start with that, start with the positives. But I do think that given that we, some of our systems are under a lot of pressure, we are going to have to think about how we work together a little more. So I think that was a lovely conclusion. I will, I'll, there'll be a little bit of time for questions. Lovely conclusion because we should all celebrate where we've got but we've still got, but also recognise that we've still got quite a long way to go and everyone in this room will be contributing to that process and as I've said on numerous occasions, cultural change, and that's really what we're talking about, takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight. We wouldn't have been talking about this issue five, six, seven years ago and we're now talking about it and we're now thinking about how we respond to it and that's something which we should all be, be celebrating and we should be all be proud of. So that's good, I think, um, although we still have many gaps and many things that we need to do in the future. So um, time, there's time for a little bit of questions, uh, a few questions. Um, any questions? Yes, back back there. Yes, I'm sorry, I can't. Anyone like to comment on that? I think we're starting to talk about trauma-informed approaches to perpetrators and I think that's recognition of you don't just wake up one day and you're a perpetrator. We need to understand the context and the history. It doesn't excuse the violence. It doesn't excuse the controlling behaviours. But it is um, an awareness and a recognition that that will impact on the person um, and also what they'll need from us in terms of their ability to be supported to change their behaviour. So um, we can't sadly turn back time and 
uh, you know, have it all play out differently. I think we can instill perpetrators with hope, though, when they see that we're intervening with their young people differently, um, because we will be able to then uh, share with them, we're going to do this because we can see the destruction, we can see what it does to families down the track. And so the support we provide to your family comes from a place of not wanting this to play out again in the next generation. Um, I think it's a great comment. Uh, the reason I say it's a great comment is uh, just in the last week, um, I sit on the Ministerial Youth Advisory Committee with Minister Donnellan and 80% of the children at the, la the last meeting and the meeting before that and the meeting before that talked about how they felt the system had failed their parents by not providing them with the treatment they, they should be entitled to. And they weren't living, most of these kids weren't living with their families for a range of reasons. One would have been extreme family violence, but they were very upset that their families had been let down, which I thought was just absolutely... I mean, these kids are... If we work with them, they're going to rule the world. You know, they're remarkable. But also, another young person said to me the other day, we're not really addressing the generational issues. So what, 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 why, did, why was my mother such a mess? And, you know, why, why didn't we address, help her address her, her trauma so she could live a reasonable life? So I think the kids are telling us that. So we really do need to address it. It's a great question. Terrific question. Any other? Yes. Yes, hello, I'm Lisa. I'm the person you mentioned. I'm down from um, the ACT with the Children's Commissioner. And I must say, to be in Victoria and we look at things like your marum, where we're struggling to get a three-question common risk assessment up and we're fighting hard to do that. So we, we look with envy. Um, and yet one space I think we are trying to to take some lead is the, the, the listening to young people themselves. And, and that's what we've been doing. So I was interested in the comment that we know it is hard um, to do that research because of ethics frameworks. And I suppose my perspective is that if, if they have to live with it, we can certainly talk about it. Um, and we seem to find ways to stop ourselves doing that. Um, I'm sure for practitioners, you have the conversations you're working with young people. Um, so my question really to all of the panel is, what do you think it is that stops us being able to listen to the young person at the centre and to be a bit more young person led in our practice. What what is it that that are the structures that stop us doing that? Can I just comment on the ethics committee because um, so you don't take no for an answer is the answer, mm -hmm. and um, you have to realise your role in educating an ethics committee that you're not going to traumatise young people by talking to them about trauma. You're not going to traumatise them by asking and inviting them to talk about their experiences. Um, and having applied for ethics in, an, in numerous different um, organisations, seen how difficult it can be to get the message across the line that this is okay. We can get ethics approval to poke and prod and do all sorts yep. of weird and wonderful things to people, but sometimes it's really hard when you just want to talk to people. Um, and so it's just um, helping others that want to do this research know the pathway to take to get it across the line because young people will thank us for persevering. And as you say, you know, it's hard for them. So it should, shouldn't be this hard for us, though, to make it possible. Um, I agree with that, of course. I think one thing we can't underestimate is the impact in our country of the um, Royal Commission into Institutional Child Sex Abuse and the recognition of the long-term and systemic silencing of children's voices. Now, of course, you, you know, that, that was an historic view but also a contemporary view and I think it's had a really profound effect on our understanding of children's experience of trauma and their rights to be heard in the, in the present. Um, I'd probably just um, confirm that comment. And I also, my reflection today is there's been lots of commentary about the invisibility of children and young people. And I think that is a barrier in our, in our historical policy and practice how, as we start to increase visibility of children and young people in their own right. And I think as a system, we become more confident to ask the questions because I think that's probably where we're on the cusp of. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Is that what time is it? Yes. Um, just in regards to the children that are living out of this experience and um, being excluded, are they 
sorry, if I can just... Uh, Yes, you can sorry. Mic, um, well. Just in regards to the children that are living in out of home care and may have um, been relinquished to out of home care because of their violent behaviour within the home, um, I've heard a lot today saying that the programs don't really suit these children because the mother or the victim needs to be there within the program. So, what can we do for those kids? Because I just like I work in out of home care and I see so many placements breaking down all the time due to the kids still displaying the same behaviours towards their carers and it's just like burning out carers and it's like a whole systematic thing. I'm just wondering, is there anything we can do to support these children? Because I think they sort of slip through the cracks. I was just wondering whether Cathy Humphreys might, might want to say something about that. I'll put you on the spot, Cathy, you may not. I mean, I think I think it's a really um, important, a terribly important space, and I guess I'd point to, you know, just I was just thinking about the. I'm just going back to kind of the ethics issues because you know Anita did her PhD interviewing young people in a primary care setting. She actually got went and interviewed and got interviewed by the ethics committee. She still wasn't allowed to mention the word domestic violence. So she had to talk to young people about safety in their sense of safety, but not about violence. Or but we've been the, successes since. There's been successes since, and then Gemma McGibbon talking to young people about how to who'd been through a treatment program about how do you prevent um, how what would have prevented their sexually harmful behaviours, and I think that you know she had really rich response to that, and then she's taken that work. So Gemma's taken that work on sexually harmful behaviours into the out-of-home care sector with MacKillop and they're really developing a lot of work really in this sort of secondary prevention space about young people. And I think there's some very good ideas there that they're really working with now with young people around three different strategies about working in with particularly young people in resi, resi care. And then um, now they're uh, in this next space uh, taking the next year to look at how do you would roll this out in foster care, looking at particularly um, the ways in which you can talk to young people about sexuality, which they appreciate enormously. Like these young people have been overexposed to sex, but have had very little sexual education. Mm. And so, you know, there's some, some things about sexual exploitation, sexually harmful behaviours that are really, I think, being addressed in a way with some new work there that I think is very interesting. In. And important. I might just make a comment about what you're talking about, if that's okay. So, um, the level of violence that um, brings kids into care, and then the level of violence that some children are exhibiting in residential care, is astonishing. Uh, which is, I know what you're referring to, um, to the point that WorkSafe is all over residential care in Victoria now. So. Um, this issue about adolescent violence is affecting everybody. It's affecting mothers who can no longer care for their children, workers who are trying to care for children every day. And some of the, some of what we hear about the sort of violence, it's, it's really quite scary. Um, but I do think there are solutions. I think there are programs and initiatives that are, that even though it looks impossible, um, and some of these kids are exhibiting incredibly violent behaviours to themselves, to others and to workers. I think there is some, you know, we are going to have to think about scaling up some of the things that are more effective because actually with the right solutions, those kids can go home. So, and they're just, they're angry. They do not want to be there. They actually want to be at home. Um, so I think that we've got a little bit of a, we've got a, We've got a problem on our hands because I think we've seen the violence really, really rise um, in, in residential care and it's tough for workers as well. So I just want to acknowledge that. Now, they were terrific questions. Um, I think, though, that we've got to call the session to an end, don't we? Um, I think we do. Uh, so thank you. Uh, to, could you all thank our wonderful panellists? <laughs> and thank you all for your questions.